Hello everyone and welcome to the world of entrepreneurship. This course is specifically focused on entrepreneurial development and we're working from the text from Bamford and Brewerton uh, 2019. And this text is about the science, the art and the processes associated with entrepreneurialism. All right. So what does that mean? <laughs> uh, the science is all about the science of practice. We are well informed by much research about entrepreneurialism and the research shows that unfortunately many businesses fail because they don't do their homework and they don't plan and so they fall over from a lack of knowledge. They might be running out of cash. They might be running out of time, for example. And uh, this text from Bamford and Brewerton is great in the sense that uh, it gives us the space to think through pertinent questions related to the science of business more than the science from this text we look at the art of business as well and what's that about it's about the concept the design and the implementation uh, that's associated with doing business so these artistic elements is where we bring our creativity skills to the fore and to understand this concept of the art of business, what we do is we look at success stories, you know, what have successful entrepreneurs done in the past? And uh, the text takes us through many real world examples. There's two running cases that uh, flow from the beginning of the text through to the end. So we're going to be picking them up each chapter. And there's 14 mini cases also presented throughout the text, which are designed to help us to understand this artistic side of doing business. Now, apart from science and art, the Bamford and Brewerton 2019 text also integrates the concepts related to the processes of business. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the conceptualization the design of business, starting and running a business and all that that entails. So essentially, we learn about what business is and how to make it happen. So we're building our comprehension of science, art and processes. And what I'm going to do with this course is provide you with short clips just like this one that take us through the content and the rationale behind what is presented in this text. So we begin with part one. Part one covers chapters one through three and chapters one through three, part one, are essentially about laying the groundwork for business. Uh, and uh, chapter one, begins with a discussion on the rationale behind why we might start a business. Then we look at the history of small business in the United States and we consider the type of people who are likely to take on an entrepreneurial venture. Then we move to a discussion of the impact of entrepreneurialism on society in the US as well as globally. And we finish up this first chapter with a final section focusing on um, uh, business plans and how they differ across different types of organisations. This first chapter from Bamford and Brewerton is titled The 21st Century Entrepreneur. So I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to get going with this for first chapter. Let's see if I can keep it short as promised. <laughs> okay, so I'm sharing the screen and, and I'm recording. Okay, good, so we're good to go. Excellent. 
All right, here we go. Bamford and Brewerton, 2019. Textbook titled Entrepreneurship, The Art, Science and Process for Success. Part one, chapters one through three, lays the groundwork for small business and chapter one is titled The 21st Century Entrepreneur. In this chapter, we're looking at explaining the rationale behind starting a business. We look at the history of entrepreneurship in the United States. We identify different people who are entrepreneurs and the impact of entrepreneurialism on society and the global impact of entrepreneurialism. And then we finish with the definition of an entrepreneurial business. So why might we want to start a business? Well, being an active member in the local community might be a good reason for starting a business. Business is about community development. And the United States government supports small business development through the US SBA or SBA, Small Business Administration. So this, this government agency provides um, uh, research to support small business, but also facilitates um, uh, information, the dissemination of information with regards to uh, the processes associated with starting a business, um, all the legalities involved, the funding that might be available, and um, uh, support along the way. So that's what the SBA does. Now, the SBA reports that 99% of all businesses in the United States are actually small business. 48% of the private sector employees are employed by small businesses and small businesses account for more than 36% of the known export value. The SBA came about because of the Small Businesses Act in 1953 and essentially they provide a wealth of information assistance about organisational development and the management of new entrepreneurial businesses. You might want to check out their website and uh, we'll be doing so in class. Okay, now let's go to the other extreme from small business to Fortune 500. And let's just recognize that every Fortune 500 organization at some point in time was a new venture. So when corporations are listed on the Fortune 500, uh, we're recognizing the success that has been achieved by once small businesses that have grown big. And um, we need to recognize as well that not all businesses will grow as big as Fortune 500, but you don't have to be that big to make money. Sometimes it's actually strategically advantageous to stay small rather than to grow. An excellent example of a small business owner with a vision that exceeded expectations is uh, Purdue. Now, Purdue, I've given you a link there to the Purdue site, started by Frank Purdue. What they did was took a commodity and that commodity was chicken meat. Um, so as a commodity, chicken meat prior to the arrival of Purdue was essentially unbranded and a generic product. What Purdue did was uh, produce um, processed meat on a large scale and they branded it. So they took this uh, commodity, enacted a brand strategy, enacted economies of scale, and they turned chicken meat into a, a product in demand. Now, you might not know Frank Perdue, but do you know any successful entrepreneurs? Why do you think that they're successful? And I will ask each student and maybe each person viewing 
this clip, go and talk to somebody who's a successful entrepreneur, interview them, ask them about how they came to be where they are currently at, and then report back to see how they define success. So what am I talking about economies of scale? I mentioned that Purdue enacted economies of scale, right? So economies of scale are essentially when you have a larger production organization and uh, in producing a large amount, you're enabling the average cost to decrease as the production increases. And that's because you're not only buying in the raw ingredients in bulk or, or um, deriving those raw ingredients in bulk as per Purdue in the chicken farms, for example, um, and then putting that large amount of raw materials into a large and increasingly larger production run so that then when it comes to distribution again you're dealing with a large quantity and therefore so you're achieving economies of scale so when the uh, production runs are increasingly larger you're going to get um, uh, incremental experience gains, but you're also going to achieve efficiencies because you're operating at that level of scale that would not be achieved at a smaller scale. So to give you an example, Walmart and all of their purchasing power means that they can buy at lower prices and sell at lower prices. And similarly for the products on their shelves where they can achieve economies of scale because of the mere sheer quantities that they are purchasing. Similarly, when they're buying advertising, again, it's purchased at a large volume. Um, for Purdue, the cost per unit in manufacturing decreases when that volume is increasing. And um, economies of scale are typically associated with large organizations. And so how do small businesses compete with the efficiencies achieved with an economy of scale? Well, the, the, the point of entrepreneurialism is that small businesses are agile, they can be more responsive, they can respond effectively in a, a timely and a customized manner for specific customer needs. Large organizations can't move like that. And so small businesses actually have um, some advantage over the larger businesses. So there's critical elements that an entrepreneur must solve for success. We need to generate sales, we need sustainable profit margins, and we need to be properly financed, as in bankrolled. We need to have money behind us to do what we need to do. So how does that happen? Well, let's look at the history of entrepreneurialism in the United States, and let's figure out that broader context, that historical context in the first instance. So in the nine, sorry, in the 1880s, all businesses were small businesses. In fact, everything that was produced was produced domestically. In other words, in the home. Um, uh, and you might have bartered some with your neighbor, for example, but trade was essentially one-on-one. -on -one. Then the industrial revolution arrived in the 1880s. And what this did was uh, enabled the initial development of the US's industrial base. Through machinery, through technology, for example. And by 1910, Henry Ford had delivered uh, 
the T model Ford and that T model Ford has had been achieved because he arranged the resources um, uh, to arrive at something that could appeal to the mainstream consumers. So let's, let's look at the car industry prior to 1910. The, car, the automobile industry prior to 1910, prior to Henry Ford delivering the T model, um, uh, essentially all cars were handmade, right? And then what happened with uh, technological innovation was that machinery um, arrived on the scene. And um, Henry Ford, what Henry Ford figured out is that he could arrange his raw ingredients, his machinery, and his workforce uh, in such a way where he was able to achieve economies of scale that had not been achieved previously. And so for this reason, Henry Ford is known as the father of the assembly line. And quite famously, he's quoted as saying, you can have any color you like as long as it's black, right? So <laughs> he wasn't just promoting black vehicles. What he was doing was making sure that even his purchase of paint achieved economies of scale. Um, and therefore, even the purchasing of paint for the end product um, was going to enable him to deliver an affordable vehicle, a vehicle that was affordable for the masses. So that was in 1910. Then along came World War I and World War um, II. In between, there was the Great Depression, uh, where that generation of people learned to be very resourceful. But, it, but the Depression years were very hard on business and very hard on people. So when they moved into World War II, as I suppose concerning as it might be to make this statement, it's a truthful statement. World War II brought America out of those depression years. In other words, um, uh, war associated production, including the production of arms and weaponry, enabled the US to move out of those depression years. Post World War II, there was a population boom, and that was the baby boomers arriving on the scene. And as the baby boomers um, from born in the uh, uh, 40s and 50s moved through their life cycle from babies to toddlers to school children to adolescents and to young adults, so too did the business world move along with that demographic evolution. And we saw, or we can look back historically and note the particular brands that grew up with these businesses. Gerber Baby Food uh, in the 40s, then owned by Procter & Gamble. Uh, in the 60s, we saw um, the baby boomers who were then adolescents embrace the rebelliousness of Wrangler jeans, for example. <laughs> with the help of Hollywood, that happened. Um, in the 1980s, when the baby boomers were um, uh, realizing that they were no longer young and fit, Reebok was a brand that did well to cash in on uh, the wannabe fitness age. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the suburbs grew up 
around the demand for um, housing as the baby boomers moved into their years of growing their own families. So the 1980s also saw uh, a technological age arrive. And this technology was more accessible than had previously been the case. And so small business was able to use technology to enable them to more effectively compete with large businesses. In fact, small businesses did a better job of customizing their products and services than what large businesses did, again, because of the agility, the responsiveness. Um, so entrepreneurialism has historically been the backbone of the economic success of a nation. This figure gives a little bit more detail of the evolution of business in the in United States, and I'll leave you to read a little bit more about that. Starting one's own business means the owner can be his or her boss. Well, that might be a good reason for you to think that you want to start your own business. Um, but uh, it's not all about you. Each and every business must look to their stakeholders who has um, some sort of interest in this firm succeeding and let's get them on board and we refer to such groups as stakeholders so we're talking about our um, our team our in-house team our employees we're talking about our customers um, and they the, our customers might be other organizations our customers might be end user consumers um, but we're also talking about uh, uh, local government, city councils, state governments, federal governments, lobby groups, um, and the broader community. Each of these groups are stakeholders that we must keep in mind uh, when we are seeking to strategically enact our business. So individuals have achieved their success by taking the bold step to start and run a business and nearly half and half the millionaires in the united states began as entrepreneurs and there's a link there a calculator to see when you are going to arrive at your first million so i'll leave you to play with that all right let's look at the question of um, I, I mentioned that stakeholders include the broader community. So how does a society benefit from an entrepreneurial mindset? Oops. Well, the community benefits in terms of economic development, economic strength. Um, entrepreneurs generate employment, they generate tax revenue for the local city, for example, which enables infrastructure and investment in the local community to be increased. And uh, small businesses provide a basis to improve the area's economic vitality, but so too can large businesses and so um, community economic development organizations will deliberately work to entice and incentivize businesses to come into their area to to come into their community and contribute towards the development of their community and some communities some areas some geographies do better at that than others um, so entrepreneurial businesses have the ability to generate profits in mar markets that might have been written off by large corporations as not big enough. So a small business can be um, uh, uh, more effective at niche marketing, um, identifying the needs of that niche and meeting the needs of that niche in a way 
that large corporations might not even be interested in. So the flexibility of ownership allows workers to meet their own needs. Um, in Memphis, Tennessee, they have a program, they being the city, has a program called economic gardening. And this economic gardening is pitched as a way to revitalize key elements in the city's economy. All right. So we need to recognize what are the key elements that we want to revitalize. And if Memphis can do it, then of course Nashville can do it. So what opportunities do you see in the Nashville, Tennessee community and have these opportunities attracted other businesses, large or small? Let's figure that out. Regard, beyond the local community, let's talk about the global community. The World Bank estimates that one of the strongest factors in, in the growth of a nation's gross national product is the presence of small and medium sized businesses. So uh, all nations, well, mostly all nations, encourage the development of small to medium sized enterprises. And the World Bank um, supports that development of small to medium enterprises um, through microloans, for example, as do other groups apart from the World Bank. But uh, the World Bank has a large amount of effort, uh, a range of programs that assist new venture startups throughout the developing world as well as the developed world. Um, and the result of this effort is that the pace of startups is increasing around the world. Um, all right. So in the context of COVID and this global pandemic that we find ourselves in, that is reinventing the business world, what products are in demand, what services are in demand and how those products and services are delivered, COVID is changing the dynamics of our business world as we know it. But when there's uh, a, a, a global change in the dynamics, as has been brought about by the COVID global pandemic, there is much opportunity. The point is, though, that some people will see these opportunities better than others. Similarly, with regards to climate change, climate change is a devastating and dire um, uh, context that we currently live in. And the experts have been sounding warnings for years. Well, while some people continue to deny climate change, others are holding on to the remnants of the fossil fuel industry, for example, and yet others with more of an entrepreneurial mindset are moving into the space where there's much business opportunity to be realized with regards to renewable energy, for example. So, what is an entrepreneurial business? Well, you might assume that it's small and um, uh, a small business will typically have less than 500 employees. Um, small to medium sized businesses, SMEs, may well be a family business. Uh, now, apart from small to medium sized businesses, um, we have startups and startups might be a solo um, organization, small solo run organization. It might be a partnership. Maybe uh, this startup is backed by uh, venture capitalists and um, some startups have uh, a strong backing by venture capitalists and sometimes known as angel investors. And what they will do is come in with a harvest plan. So essentially what 
what we're talking about there is that the venture capitalists will fund the startup to um, springboard it into a growth cycle. Unfortunately, the downside is that they may well be heavily laden with debt and um, they have uh, There's risk associated with that growth. Um, and uh, a venture capitalist startup, a, a venture, venture, a VC backed startup will probably have an experienced um, leader, an experienced leadership team to grow the firm. They will have a, they will have structured their organization um, to follow that leader they may develop multiple locations or branches of the operation again to reinforce that growth curve but essentially it's highly risky and uh, a, a vc backed startup may actually employ a large number of people well given the high risk that's a large number of people that are going to be caught out if um, the risk comes to bear so small businesses that are not VC backed are typically self-funded and oriented around a positive cash flow rather than um, deliberate debt. So the entrepreneurial firms that are self-funded are structured to harness the skills of the founders and they're typically designed on the image and the philosophy of the founders. Um, they might even be built around the personal goals of the founders. And many of these uh, entrepreneurial startups consist of, like, for example, a, a solo setup or a partnership. So there might be zero employees, there might be one or two, there might be less than 100. All right. Okay, Facebook. Facebook is an example of a, um, started in 2004, an example of a, an innovation that started very small, one campus so that college students could talk to each other. And um, it's grown into the mammoth global social media platform that it is today. And, uh, while Mark Zuckerberg's story is more of the exception than the rule, what can we learn from Facebook's success uh, when we are thinking about starting a business? Well, I think what we can learn is dream big and, um, and have a go. Uh, uh, put your toe in the water and see what happens. Um, be ready and willing to move with the development of your business. Now, while there may be issues associated with Facebook as in, in the current context, like for example, with um, privacy concerns, like for example, with market dominance concerns, so Facebook owned by Mark Zuckerberg, also owns Instagram and other platforms. And so, um, you know, their dominance is a concern. But there's also the concern of uh, this dissemination of misinformation and disinformation. And Zuckerberg claiming that uh, it's not his role to censor what goes out on his platform. Hmm. Well, if it's not his responsibility, I'm not sure whose responsibility it is, but see, Facebook operates online and the internet is a largely deregulated context. And so um, legalities need to catch up with um, what's currently going on in cyberspace. All right, so we've talked about different types of firms. We've talked about VC backed firms and we've talked about entrepreneurial firms. 
Um, in summary, VC-backed firms, the business plan is typically written and used as a promotional tool. They might use their business plan to bring uh, consultants on board and uh, entice other executives to come um, work for their organisation. And they will typically uh, look about 25 to 45 pages long, very glossy, very graphic, very enticing. Now, in contrast to a VC-backed firm and the business plan as a promotional tool, entrepreneurial tools will develop their business plan as an actual guide to running the business. And it's typically the business owners that do develop their own plans. They're a bit shorter, 15 to 25 pages. And the goal of the plan is to be a guide, to provide a self-evaluation and to provide information necessary to evaluate the key criteria. And I think the essence of the plan for a startup, um, a self-funded entrepreneurial startup, is the process associated with thinking through the questions posed in the development of a business plan. And the Bamford and Brewerton 2019 text takes us through this process. So we learn to develop the elements of the plan by stepping through the content in each chapter. And um, uh, at the end of chapter one, we're actually asking you to create a one page pitch for your business as a first step to the business planning process. Now, a startup business um, that is a lean startup indicates that uh, they, they being the operators, the founders, the owners, um, need to uh, be able to flex and curb with the changing market dynamics. And this is their competitive edge. They know they being the owners and operators of a lean startup, um, they know that they have to focus on building a business that generates something that the customer actually wants. They know that they have to work towards economies of scale um, to achieve a cost leadership position. They know that they have to uh, shorten the length of time, the lead time it takes to get to market and uh, technology is helping that happen. And a lean startup must also be flexible um, and adaptable to change. Well, okay, we said that at the beginning. All right, so who is the 21st century entrepreneur? It's somebody who wants to step into the space. The 21st century entrepreneur is, uh, um, informed on the science, the art, and the processes. So they in, are informed with regards to knowledge that is being gathered from research to date, right? So we're going to take an evidence-based approach. We're going to recognise that creativity is and artistic elements are definitely part of being a 21st century entrepreneur, as are the processes. The value of business planning is in the process of the business planning task. All right, so there you go, there's chapter one. Hope you like, and uh, I look forward to joining you joining me again for chapter two. See you soon.